Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You know, if you're ever going to overcome fear, the first thing you have to do is decide that you're going to break up with fear. That you're going to have an attitude toward yourself. No fear lives here. The only acceptable attitude that a Christian should have is I will not fear. And you know, King David, the psalmist David, he said that several times in the Psalms, I will not fear. What can man do unto me? If God is for me, who can be against me? And I love that I will not fear. He certainly wasn't saying I don't feel fear. He was making a decision that he was not going to let fear rule his life. And I think that's the first thing that we all have to do. You know, sometimes you've had something for so long in your life that you just get miserably comfortable with it. You don't really like it, but you've had it for so long that you settle down and just think, well, I guess this is the way it is, or this is just the way I am, or this is the way life is. And you don't even believe that you can live any other way. You know, in my childhood, I was abused sexually by my dad for a lot of years. And so my life was rooted in fear. My dad was an angry man and he drank a lot and he would come home angry and get violent with my mom and rant and rave and yell and then there was all the abuse and I just remember growing up in fear. And so it was challenging for me to learn to not live in that fear. And I had to learn one thing at a time, one step at a time, one day at a time. But I have learned a lot of things over the years and I believe you can benefit from some of the experiences that I've gone through. Some of them were very difficult, some were painful, but I believe that I can help you avoid some of that pain in your life if you will also learn to say, I will not fear. You know, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not from God. God has given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. When fear attacks us, it's the enemy, it's the devil, and he's always trying to get us or to keep us from making progress. Let's just say, for example, that you want to go back to college. Maybe you're in your 40s and you never got a college degree and you've decided you'd like to go to college and get a degree. Well, probably the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be afraid that maybe you're too old or you're going to be afraid that you can't learn at your age or you're going to be afraid you won't get accepted into college. One thing's for sure, if God's put a good idea in your heart, something that's going to bless you and bless your family, something that's a desire of your heart, it's not God then putting that fear in there telling you not to do it, but it is the enemy because he doesn't want you to make progress. So I'm asking you today, if you will make a decision, first and foremost, I am not going to live in fear. Now that doesn't mean that you will never feel fear, but it does mean that you can learn how to conquer it and overcome it. And we're gonna talk more about that. Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We're so excited to receive from you. We love your word. Love it, love it, love it. And we appreciate it. And uh, we thank you for the power in it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking this weekend about healthy living, spirit, soul, and body. How to be not a broken person that maybe has a little bit of healing in this area, but don't have any healing in a lot of other areas. How to be whole in your spirit. Spiritual health comes from, first of all, receiving Christ as your Savior. Jesus said, come to me. That's simple. We can do that. Last night, at the close of the meeting, we had 588 souls come to Jesus. And so that's great. And tonight, I believe that we'll have just as many, if not more, people that just say, I can't live this life on my own. I'm tired of trying to do it alone. And I just want to I'm, gonna, I'm just going to come to Jesus and believe he'll take me just the way I am and help me be what he wants me to be. And in addition then to receiving Christ, spiritual wholeness continues as we learn to walk according to the word of God, as we learn obedience to God. And we found out that we have to depend on the Holy Spirit for that to happen and that it doesn't happen all of a sudden, all at once. It happens little by little from glory to glory, day by day. So we got to have a little bit of patience along the way. And I've been teaching people for years to believe and say, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. I'm okay, and I'm on my way. Even though I'm in the middle, I'm on my way to something great. 
Amen. Then this morning, we talked about physical wholeness. Had a lot of fun talking about taking care of your body and not abusing yourself and got a lot of good comments about that. And so I think that not only did we have a good time, but some of you had an eye-opening word from God that it's time to stop being a gambler and start being an investor. Don't gamble that you can abuse yourself by not sleeping, not eating right, having too much stress in your life, being overworked, out of balance in every area and get by with it. We're not playing Monopoly where you roll the dice and hope you get something good. And then if you get in trouble, think you can get out of, get a, get out of jail free card and go on to the next thing. We're, we want to be not gamblers, but investors. You want to invest in yourself because you're worth it. Now, tonight we're going to talk about mental health. So maybe turn to somebody next to you and say, how's your mental health? <laughs> now, you know, that sounds a lot funnier than what it really is. <laughs> Would you agree that probably our mind gives us more trouble than anything? You know why that is? Because the mind is the battleground that Satan comes and attacks us on. Thus, the book that I wrote, The Battlefield of the Mind. If you can win the battle in your mind, then you can win the battle for life. Where the mind goes, the man follows. So, an obedient mind will lead to an obedient life. A disobedient mind will lead to a disobedient life. So if you made a decision last night or at any time in, in your life, I want to not just be a Christian, I want to be an obedient Christian. I want to be a child of God who wants to do what's right and does what's right and glorifies God. I don't want to be mediocre and, and compromising and just see what all I can get by with and hope I can still sneak in the back door of heaven. I want to love God with my whole heart and do it right. And I'm sure that most of you have made that decision. But a lot of times people make that decision, but it never happens for them because although they made a good decision and they have a good desire, they never change their mind. They still think junk. They have stinking thinking. And anytime we have stinking thinking, we're going to have a stinking life. So, amen. Is that right? So the devil constantly attacks our thoughts. And, but believe it or not, in the beginning, if you first start trying to cooperate with the Spirit of God to think right things, you are going to feel like you're in a battle from daylight till dark. And you just get so tired of fighting the enemy all day, you don't hardly know what to do. But I can tell you, if you stand your ground, it gets better and better and better and better and better. And, you know, although my mind still gets attacked, there's always things that the enemy is suggesting to my mind. But after all these years now in practice, I mean, I recognize them really quickly. And it's not that difficult at all to just say, nope, I'm not going there. I've been there. I've done that. I know what it produces. And I'm not going to think like that. Thus, I have a Dave story for you. <laughs> Amen. Now, um... There are certain thoughts that we can have that will cause a lot of strife. How many of you know what strife is? It's like, uh, it's an angry undercurrent in your home. It can be bickering, arguing, outright fighting, yelling, screaming. But many times it's just like an angry undercurrent. It's like everybody's kind of acting like, praise the Lord. And yet you're seething mad inside because you don't like something that went on, you didn't get your way about something, or whatever the case might be. So you have to learn how to shut your mind against strifeful thoughts. And as soon as they come, you need to say, this is going nowhere. I've been there, done that, and I'm going to change my mind, get in agreement with God, and let God take care of the situation. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. It's funny how God is. I meant to end with this story, and here I am starting with it. 2 Timothy 2, 23, but refuse, and I love this in the Amplified Bible. How do you refuse? You shut your mind against, have nothing to do with, come on, shut your mind against, have nothing to do with 
trifling, ill-informed, unedifying, stupid controversies over ignorant questions. <laughs> For you know that they foster strife and breed quarrels. Now, to be honest with you, I wish that men would learn a little bit more about how to kind of work with women, but after all these years, they still just don't get it, you know? So I'm in bed one night. Dave had gone somewhere with my son. Where did you guys go? Where were you that night? Where were you when you went to that car dealer? Somewhere. They went somewhere. Anyway, after they were done, they decided they were going to go to the dealer and just look. <laughs> now, how many of you know when a man goes with his 34-year-old son to look that that could breed trouble right there? I don't know what it is with men in cars. I could drive the same one till the tires fell off and wouldn't care. As long as it looked decent and gave me a good ride, I'd be okay. But they think they got to have a new one every time you turn around. And no matter how old they get, they like loud ones that sound mean when you sit, like go, <laughs> and uh, so I, keep it in mind, now I'm in bed, I'm getting very sleepy, ready to go to sleep, phone rings, hi, babe. <laughs> Me and Dan are at the car dealer. Well, I've been around this mountain before, so I'm already going like, Come on, ladies, you got to watch the attitude because you're already going down the drain as soon as the attitude comes. <laughs> and uh, he said, I'd really like to get this. You know, this is the last, they said this is the last year they're going to make it. <laughs> now, the last time this happened was maybe like eight or nine years ago, and that salesman said this is the last one in the country. No, the last, there was only four made, and this was one of the le four left in the country, and so he had to get it right now, couldn't put it off. So Now, you know, my husband is really wise, and he is usually not fooled by anything. It's hard to snow him, but when it comes to cars <laughs> or golf clubs, he's a lost cause. And, but that's okay. We've all got our thing. So I'm like, Dave. Don't tell me you're going to want to buy a car. You don't need a car. You don't need a race car. You're 74 years old. What do you want with a race car? <laughs> and then I made the premium female mistake. I said, you're too old to drive a car like that. Well, mm, not good. That was not good. So then my son gets on the phone, who I'm very close to, and he can, he's my baby, so he can talk me into a lot of stuff. Oh, come on, Mom. Me and Dad want this car. It'll be for us. We'll have so much fun. It'll be a, a, a father-son thing. I'm like, Danny? <laughs> he doesn't need that car. We've got a nice car. We don't need that car. So anyway, long story short, he's like, well, I, I really think I'm going to get the car. So we see that even though I didn't want the car, we were still going to get the car, and that's, you know, then comes up the submission thing. Okay, how am I going to act about this? Mm, yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> and um, so how many of you ladies see where this, this is going? This is, this is not getting good. So hung the phone up, and I'm just pretty, like, not so happy. So I just had this quick revelation He's getting the car. I can be mad or I can be glad. I can love him enough to let him have what he wants and be happy that he's happy because Dave just is really easy going with me. He'll let me do just about anything that I want to do. And uh, so I called him up and I said, okay, you know, it's not that I don't want you to have the car, which really, I didn't really want him to have the car, but I said, it's not that I don't want you to have the car. I want you to be happy, so if you want the car, go ahead and get it. Oh, thank you, babe. Hung the phone up again. So then I'm thinking, we don't have any parking spots left in our garage. <laughs> Wonder where he's going to park this car. Now, I have a little car that he bought me about seven years ago, and I don't drive it much. It's got 12,000 miles on it, but he bought it for me, and it's cute, and I like it, and, you know, so... I've said to him several times, you know, I don't hardly ever drive this car. Maybe I just ought to sell it or, you know... 
Think about giving it to one of the kids. No, you can't get rid of that car. I bought you that car. You need to keep that car. I want you to have that car. So then I said, so where are you going to park this car? And he said, well, I was thinking maybe you could get rid of your car. <laughs> so now I had to go through it all over. Oh, that's nice. I can get rid of my car so you can have two cars sitting out there, one of which you don't. And then I'm like, come on, ladies, you ever have to? And so I said, Dave, why is it that every time I've talked about selling that car, you say, keep the car, keep the car. You don't want to get rid of the car. He said, now, are you ready for this? This was a low blow. He said, well, in Ecclesiastes, it says there's a time for everything. <laughs> now, I mean, it is really bad when you use Scripture to get what you want. <laughs> Amen. Come on, give Dave a big hand. So it's a stick shift, and it's got a lot of horsepower. So he took me for a ride, and he had not driven a stick shift in so long that he wasn't doing a great job. And so I thought I was going to have to go to the chiropractor for a neck adjustment. But I mean, seriously, it was like. I said, if you think I'm riding around in this thing, you are crazy. I am never getting in this car again. Then he went and had louder pipes put on it. The guy's 74 years old. And now this thing roars when my son is in it and he calls it's like brr, 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 brr. Dave said I can't wait to get home and take you for a ride would you guys all please pray for me I've lost my parking space I've lost my car I'm trying to be a nice obedient wife but here's the thing that I'm trying to tell you to make the story fit into my message tonight there would have been years ago I would have been mad about that for weeks, and even after I started talking to him, I would have still had strife in my heart and been thinking all kinds of bitter thoughts, maybe for months. Oh, that's nice for you, you get what you want. <laughs> and you know what, I can tell you the whole deal for me lasted about seven minutes. It was done and over with. I'm like, God, you take care of it, it's not my problem. I hope he's happy with his car. I'm gonna go on and be happy with my life. Come on, we don't have to let our minds control us. Now, that's not an invitation for all you guys to try to go out and get a car thinking because your wife heard this message, she now has to be nice about it. I got a couple of guys out there today that are a little too excited about this. I don't know. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I love to share practical examples that help us really get the Word of God down on a level where we can live within our homes every day. You don't have to fight all the time. Let God fight your battles. I figure if he wants Dave to have the car, it's useless for me to fight about it. And, you know, it, it's good. I mean, really, if I look at his side of it, do you have any idea how many thousands of times Dave's had to sit down there and listen to me do this? He deserves a present, amen? <laughs> oh, oh, aren't I sweet? Come on, oh. <laughs> Second Corinthians 10, four and five, for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. See, if you have a selfish, self-centered stronghold in your mind, then it's almost impossible not to get mad when you don't get your way. But inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, now watch this, we and we lead every thought and purpose away captive unto the obedience of Christ the Messiah. So, here's the way it goes. You learn the word, and the word becomes like a light on the inside of you. And when a wrong thought comes, one that's gonna lead you into trouble, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to remember what Jesus wants you to do. And right there you have a choice to make. You cannot keep thinking the wrong thing and do the right thing. Did you hear me? You cannot keep thinking the wrong thing and do the right thing. 
I said, you cannot keep thinking the wrong thing and do the right thing. Let's just say that somebody's addicted to pornography, which there's lots of people today that are. Okay, you can't sit around and look at and imagine pornographic material and hope to not have that get you in trouble. Nobody just suddenly falls into adultery. There's been a lot of thinking that's gone on ahead of time. And the place you need to stop the problem is when it first comes into your mind, you bring that thought into obedience to Jesus Christ and you say, God, help me. I am not going to think like that. I'm not going there in my mind because if you go there in your mind, you're likely to go there in your life. Come on now. If you don't want to overeat, don't think about food all the time. Just that simple. If you want to work out and exercise, don't sit around and think about and talk about how hard it is. It's so hard. I just, oh, this is just so hard. I don't think I can do this. Where the mind goes, the man follows. I got some interesting things to share with you tonight, I believe. We cannot have an obedient life and have a disobedient mind. Joshua 1.8. I don't think anybody ever gets tired of hearing messages about our thoughts, do we? A spiritual mind is a mind of peace. Not a mind that's full of turmoil and worry and anxiety and judgment and criticism and all kinds of stuff like that. Now, God had a great life planned out for Joshua, and he wanted to use him in a great way. And at the very beginning of what God was calling him to do, this great thing God was calling him to do, he starts out and he says, verse 7, Only you be strong and very courageous that you might do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. So he's saying, okay, here's my words to you. Now, you be obedient to this. Let it be the center of your life and do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left. Can I tell you that I'm proud of you for being here tonight, many of you all weekend. I'm proud of those of you that are watching the TV program right now, and many of you watch it day after day after day. That tells me that you love the Word. You're making an investment in the Word of God, and I hope and pray that you're here hearing it because you intend to do it. Amen? And I believe when we hear it, there's power inherent in it that energizes us to be able to do it. The only thing that's better than hearing the Word is studying the Word for yourself. And I think that if you put those two together, it becomes a powerhouse. He says, if you do this, you'll prosper everywhere you go. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. In other words, he's saying, speak it. I talk all the time about speaking the Word of God. I don't know if you've gotten the message yet or not, but you need to talk out loud when you're home by yourself, when you're in your car. One of the most powerful things that you can do is confess the Word of God out loud over your own mouth. The Bible says in Isaiah 55 that the, wor the words that come forth out of my mouth shall not return void. Well, I don't believe God is just talking about His mouth. He's talking about the mouth of those who belong to Him. When you speak the Word of God out of your mouth, it helps renew your mind, and it keeps it fresh in you, and it energizes you to be able to do it. I think it's pretty safe to say that we would all love to have a, a healthy mind. And you know, part of being healthy mentally, I believe, is to be able to make right decisions. We need to have what I call a, a made-up mind. We need to know what God wants us to do and then make our minds up that we're going to do it through His grace. I think that we need to learn how to walk by the Word of God.
When this mother first carried her daughter into the room, our hearts sank and tears immediately sprang to our eyes. It's a far too common sight here in East Africa, children suffering from malnutrition on the verge of starvation. It's difficult to see, but something we can't ignore. We did assessment among uh, 8,000 families and I asked mothers, how many children do you have? Some would say seven, some would say eight. And I say, how many are alive? Half, four, or three. So that was the story of this village. Tell us about this family. Do you remember when you first came in contact with them? Yeah. Uh, when they brought Nagash, the Nagash was five months old, and he was very tiny, uh, malnourished in young infant. Not only him, but the, if you see the mother, she was so depressed, uh, significant weight loss, and uh, you don't see any smile on her face. And uh, also the other kids were also underweight. This is real and it's happening every single day and what they're seeing is not a starving child. They're seeing a child that will not live. That's what you're really seeing. You're seeing a child before it dies because if we don't help, the child will not survive. Pat Bradley is with Crisis Aid International, the organization that Hand of Hope has been working with in this part of the world for many years. And this new permanent clinic is taking care to a new level, offering inpatient treatment for the severely malnourished, providing families with life-saving opportunities that didn't exist before. So we admitted all the, the, all the family and uh, we give him all the care he needs. Big difference when you see him now? Now there is a huge significant difference. He's uh, gaining weight. He's so playful. <laughs> now one year old, he's trying to walk. And you can see the difference on the, all, the whole family. Well, it's wonderful to see yeah, yeah. what God can do. Were you afraid that you were going to lose your son, that he wouldn't make it? I lost hope. I thought you'd die. I, I thought you, I'm going to lose him, but I did a last attempt and brought him to the clinic. I was praying when I came to the clinic. I was praying to God. And when they said to me, yeah, we'll keep him and we'll treat him. I mean, I was, I was so happy. God has heard my prayer. There's no exaggeration. There are tens of thousands of children today who are alive because of Hand of Hope. Isaias is an amazing little man. He became our instant friend and we had such a great time with him. He and many of the kids on this playground are joyful and full of life because you've given them an opportunity to live. God answered many prayers, and you provided a way when no way existed. And many more need our loving help. You know, the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Do you think that your thoughts are random and meaningless? Or do they affect you more than you realize? Well, God's Word teaches us the importance of our thoughts. In Strijd in je Denken legt Joyce uit waarom letterlijk alles in ons leven samenhangt met ons denken. Actually, everything in life begins with a thought, even the changes that you might be looking for. 
Deze bestseller, met een oplage van ruim 6 miljoen exemplaren, heeft het leven van veel mensen al veranderd. Bestel Strijd in je Denken door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joy-meyer.nl/strijd.